and help us to begin to make us to see comparisons. And then we're hungry at God. Another reason why, another bait that the enemy uses, a feeling of personal worthiness. I deserve it. I work hard for it. Many have forgotten the Bible talks where Paul says, if anyone should boast, let him boast in the Lord. So another bait is saying that why do I have to thank God? Man, I fasted, I prayed, I put everything on the line. And we are highlighting everything that we did. So when eventually it happens the way we have anticipated, why do I have to be thankful? I work for it. I labor for it. And I deserve it. I could not deserve anything less. Jesus told the parables in Luke chapter 12, 16 to 20. The parable in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 20. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to sow my cross. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my pounds and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? There's nothing wrong to have a good harvest. In fact, we pray for a good harvest. We pray for a better year, a better new year than last year. But Lord, I want us to always remember it is the Lord that has given you strength to get wealth. All things are from Him, all through things are, are through Him and back to Him. When your feet has yielded, when your crop has been good, you want to lift up your eyes and say, Father, I thank you. Paul may plant, Apollo may water, the increase comes from the Lord. Father, I thank you for the strength, I thank you for the ground that I, that I use, thank you for the water, and thank you for breathing on it. I'm telling you, you will enjoy it for life. Because God says, hey, I've given you some small song. The Bible says, what eyes have not seen? What evil man has not comprehended? And the things that, so if you can be this thankful, let me tell you, people of God, it's okay to come to church and roll on the ground. It's okay to come to your little hands. But God looks past our lifting our hands. God looks into the heart of man. Yep. He looks to the heart of man. And if you can test it with something poquito, like Spanish say, small and small, I thank God of heaven that is inexhaustible. He will bamboozle you that will not be room enough to contain. Amen. That's what God can do. Yep. And God will not say, well, you know, in that, do you understand? God does not run out of resources. It's inexhaustible. That can never be exhausted. In fact, we can't even fathom the breath and the richness of the God of the universe. So when we have had good harvest, Father, I thank you. Let us acknowledge him. A feeling of personal worthiness is another bait. And another bait, finally, I want to address this. A belief, a lie, that there's nothing to be thankful for. The deception of the enemy. The, that's the, why are you thankful? The same year, no, no, the same last year, you pray like nothing has happened. Ha! Ah, the devil, do you understand? That's one of the problems we have in this nation. That they know that when they have repeated the lies so much, it is difficult to change the narrative. When lies have been consistent, people become to believe it. And the devil is master. He has a 23, 300 PhDs. The devil has a father of lies. He will repeat and repeat and repeat. Before you know what is happening, you are internalizing these lies and you are living these lies and it brings a, a, a separation, a wedge between us and God. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. 
And then Philippians, one of my favorite scriptures, Philippians 4 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with what? With thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. May God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, possible reasons for ingratitude, self centeredness that even God must succumb to our will. Number two, a negative person of life. You know, when you begin to look at it, you accentuate the negative. Those who have and those who don't pray as much as you do, and yet they are doing, they are doing well, the negative, the devil will highlight that. He, that's his job. And then I say, a feeling of personal worthiness. I worked hard. I studied hard. I deserve it. I don't deserve anything less. And finally, of course, a belief that there's nothing to be thankful for. And the Bible says, let who are just married, praise the Lord. He didn't say, let those who are just born a new car, praise the Lord. No, he said, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. If there's nothing else to thank God for, thank God for life, because when there's life, there's hope. Because that was in Jesus' name. Amen. So how do we break the pattern of ingratitude? How do we break this pattern of ingratitude? I want to look at quickly, very, very quickly, I want to look at the three hours. R as in letter R, three R. The first one, reframe your experience more positively in a way that you reframe your experiences more positively. In other words, reframe more positively your unpleasant experiences. You reframe. You cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. That's why when I come to bedside and I see people who are hungry at God, I let them ventilate, I let them curse God. I don't feel offended. He's able to take care of himself. But when they have exhausted their hunger, and then I say, it's okay for me to talk now, and I begin to add them by the special grace of the Holy Spirit to begin to reframe even that sort of hunger. Then suddenly, the light is switched on. Oh, I didn't think like that. Oh, I didn't see like that. Yeah, that's okay. Reframe more positively your unpleasant experiences, knowing that you cannot control what happens to you, but you can control how you frame it. Let me give us a good example. Paul the Apostle had a strategic plan for advancing the gospel. I'm going to go to Rome. I'm going to speak to the officials, government officials. If I can just get them to listen to me, they, that will become an influence because these are opinion leaders, influencers in the society. So Paul had a strategic plan to go to Rome and talk to government officials hoping that they can use their influence to advance the gospel. Well, the good news is, or bad news, depending on the way you see it. When Paul finally got to Rome, it was not to share Jesus with the government officials. He went to Rome as a prisoner. Paul was locked up under house arrest and he was chained to a rotating contingent of guards. He had a plan to go and preach the gospel. When he got to Rome, he went as a prisoner. And he was locked under house arrest and was chained to guards who were rotating every eight hours. And, and not only that, it was awaiting possible execution. Mm. Ha! If you are Paul, what would you say? Mm. Paul prayed for opportunity. He prayed for opportunity. Listen to me, God's people. He was praying for opportunity to do nothing, to share the gospel. And it did not happen. In fact, he ended up in prison and he might lose his life. Paul's circumstances were out of his control. You've been where Paul was. You've thought if I just get the degree, I will get that job. You got the degree, but you did not get the job. You've been praying for years for some life transforming breakthroughs, but God has not answered. Every one of us has been where Paul was. Paul was in the same situation. Circumstances he did not want and could not control fell upon him. But Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. 
about what was happening to him? What do you think Paul may have said? Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really sucks. I wanted to spread the good news through preaching of the government of Israel, but that did not happen. As a result of this hell I've been through, I've been, I have decided prayer doesn't work, and I'm never going back to church again. <laughs> did you read that in your Bible? No. But that is not what Paul wrote. Even though he could have said that, how oh, this sucks? God, is it, is it a sin to serve you? Maybe if I not even come to Rome to preach, I'll be enjoying my life daily. He did not do that. Now listen to what Paul wrote. In Philippians 1.12, I'm reading from New Living Translation. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the old palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Philippians 1, 12 to 14. Paul was saying, I had a plan, God had a better plan. This is a whole different way to advance the gospel. God had a better plan. You know what God did? He had him chained to palace guards. So because they are chained to him, whether they wanted it or not, they had to listen to the gospel of Jesus. Because they are in the same, lo the same location. So Paul continued to speak the good news. And every eight hours they changed chiefs, they changed guys. So it was not the guys that were there. The money would be there in the afternoon or in the, in the evening. So they were forced because they were chained to Paul to listen to the gospel. And when they went to the town, they began to spread the news among their... So what Paul had anticipated began to happen, but differently from the way he had anticipated or planned it. This is a whole different way to advance the gospel than what, I was, than what he was thinking. God has blessed me with prison guards. That's what he was saying. God has blessed me with prison guards who are changed to me. They have no choice but to listen to me, tell them about Jesus. These soldiers have the ears of influential leaders. And get these people, every eight hours they change a new car to me, and they think I'm the prisoner. Hey, hey, God must have a sense of, 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 of what's that? Sense of what? Sense of humor, thank you. They thought Paul was the prisoner. Who was the prisoner? The guards were the prisoners. They are in chain, they have to listen to the gospel. Hey! They thought I was the prisoner, but they are the prisoner because they are forced to say and listen to the gospel and take the gospel to influential leaders. I had a plan. Hey, God had a better plan. Paul reframed his unpleasant experience more positively. And he could write the church in Philippi. Not only that, the church became bold. The members became bold when they listened. So God was doing something with the, with, the, with, the, with the guys and the church in Philippi were also they became emboldened from that experience see how God was working things out may God help us in Jesus name Amen. the second hour remind yourself that his thoughts are not your thoughts remind yourself that his thoughts are not your thoughts neither his ways your ways Sometimes we need to thank God for what he didn't do. Many times we are the enemies of ourselves. So sometimes when we pray and God does not answer, we are so able to be thankful because if he had answered the way we wanted, it would have been perilous and dangerous to us. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my way, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. They are the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. We are wise when we trust that he is working even when we are not aware of it. We are wise when we realize that he thought towards us are thoughts of good, not of evil. We are wise to, to think and to believe that he knows far better than we do know. We are wise to realize that our plan may not be the best. God has a better plan than 
our best of plans. I've shared this before. Remind yourself that it's thoughts. Not only are you reminding yourself that it's thoughts that know your thoughts, remind yourself that you could be doing any of these three things. Even when you have prayed and God has, it does not seem that God has answered, there could be three things going on at the same time. Number one, it could be waiting for you to develop the character and the attitude that goes with what you are asking. How many times our kids have asked for something we realize it's in Judas to them? It's like giving a 10 year old, doesn't matter how many cars you have, you don't give a 10 year old your car keys because you have a spare car because you know, even though it's a gift, that gift is a dangerous gift. It's a gift that can kill. So you wait for that child to become mature. When they don't succeed, they have to go through the process of getting their license. Even sometime before you let them be on the road, you sit by them to be sure they actually know what they are doing. So many times God is waiting for us to develop the attitude or the character or the attitude that we would